Before this video starts, I just want to give a massive shout out to all my channel members. If you want to receive a shout out, then become a channel member today and you'll be shown on screen like all these other channel members here. Anyways, enjoy the video. There are many legend units that you can unlock over the course of this game, from Empire of Cats all the way to the end of Uncanny Legends and the Heavenly Tower. These units are the closest units you will get to being uber rares without being ubers themselves. But out of all of these units, who can compete till the very end of the game? Some are much better than others and today, I wanted to see who is the best of the best and the worst of the worst. The criteria for this list is as follows. These units are at their current full potential as of version 12.3, being in their true form for every single unit except for the ones that don't have a true form, as well as how they function at level 50. Their generalist factors are considered, but also their specialist niche, as some units aren't good generalists but are really good in their special niche. This list is also more weight towards endgame balance due to the fact that this list covers units that are only relevant to the endgame because they're unlocked in the endgame. Uber rares are also not a factor in the making of this list. One more note, while there are only 19 legend units, there will be 20 spots in this list because one of the legend units works fundamentally different depending on which form you use and I think it's better to rank this legend unit as two separate units. Before we get started, if you enjoy this video, then why not give this video a like and if you enjoy the content on this channel, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and comment down below your personal favorite legend unit. Anyways, let's get to this list. Filibuster is first unlocked by beating the invasion stage after beating Cats of the Cosmos Chapter 3, then her true form can be unlocked after beating a whole new world and behemoth stones. At level 50, Meta Filibuster has 54,000 health and deals 54,000 damage with a 100% chance to freeze for 4 seconds against relics and traitless enemies, as well as having surge and curse immunity. They also have a standing range of 575 and with Omni Strike, they're able to hit up to minus 500 range. At first, this may sound like a great unit. However, there is one single thing that drags this unit all the way down to the bottom of this list. This being their 12 second force swing. This single downside means that they will easily miss their attacks and or will get pushed too hard to land their attack. Even if you get to land the attack, the freeze only lasts for 4 seconds, giving them a 27% uptime. Meta Filibuster is an incredibly frustrating unit to use because of the fact that they have the longest force swing in the game and in 99% of situations feels like a waste of cash in the unit slot which can be covered by much better units, especially with the anti-relic roll. This unit does have one small niche that's actually redeemable though, this being the fact that they're the only non-uber rare with Surge Immune who could outrange the omens so they do have an actual genuine niche. Outside of that situation though, this unit is never worth bringing because of this one extremely massive flaw that will make you grow wrinkles by the time they attack. Valkyrie Cat being the first legend unit unlocked in the game is all the way down here because she really is designed to be an early game unit. Her damage output is abysmal and her health is that of a wet tissue paper. The only real reason to use her at all is for enemies like Big Sal, who you need to stall as much as possible, but outside of that, there really is no reason to pick her up for late game usage. There isn't much else to mention about her, so let's just move on to the next unit. This big golden guy is a unit who's fun to use on levels with a short range or whatever you can pin enemies to the enemy base, as his standing range at an enemy base is a massive 850. Otherwise, however, he stands at 350 range and with the lack of any knockback, if any push happens, he's good as gone. His damage output isn't bad if he can land the third hit, dealing 81,000 damage, but the issue for Cat God is that he only lands this massive blow every 37 seconds. The other two attacks deal almost nothing but are good at pushing back enemies as they both have the knockback effect. However, because they have an Omni Strike that goes to negative 850 range, his knockback on zombie stages can actually be a detriment to his survival. Cat God is definitely a unit you should only true form for collection purposes as the only changes are a 1% boost to their health and earning double cash upon defeating enemies. However, I think their biggest flaw is their nearly 5 minute cooldown, meaning you will usually only get one of these guys out onto the field and he's really fragile, only having 40,905 HP, making him very easy to take out. Cat God is also extremely slow, so it'll take a long while for them to get to the enemy base in longer stages. Cat God's extremely low attack rate, poor health, mediocre range outside of short range stages, and almost 5 minute recharge make him plummet all the way down to the 18th spot.
Ultimate Mecha Bun is a unit I've discussed in the previous video, but to give a shorter version of what I think of Mecha Bun, I will give you this. Mecha Bun is a unit who is pretty useful against relic enemies like Old Horn and other relic peons due to their high DPS as well as being extremely beefy, having around 216,000 health against relic enemies. However, once you get another unit that's further down the list, it is extremely hard to justify using Mecha Bun due to the fact that this unit deals a lot more immediate damage and can actually cripple some relic enemies Mecha Bun can't. Though it is saved by the fact that in Old Horn heavy stages, Mecha Bun serves as a good option, especially in 4 star stages. Schoolbus Neandum is a support unit who has a 50% chance to slow every enemy type, including metal for 3 seconds, 3.6 seconds for treasure traits. Neandum is a unit best used to help take on high range threats thanks to his 551 range, such as Elder Sloth and Professor A, as he's one of the few non uber rare units who could damage from a far enough range without needing a stepping stone. However, outside of these situations, Neandum doesn't have a lot going for it. Neandum deals 37,000 damage and has 43,000 health, which is okay, but in the end game where everything is extremely tanky or very aggressive, this sort of health doesn't do it favors. His somewhat long recharge of almost 3 minutes doesn't help it either because it will take a while before you can start piling on the damage with this guy. Schoolbus Neandum shines best in 4 star stages, where he ends up being the unit with the 4th highest range behind Filibuster, Statue Cat, and Mega Cat. The first we already discussed, the second being a base defender, and the last unit having no damage output at all. Neandum does attack frequently enough to where you can land several hits, however, since his stats can't keep up with the late game, he's usually relegated as a 4 star extreme ranger for enemies who outrange most units. Awaken Musashi was once regarded as a top tier legend unit thanks to being a non uber wave immune unit, but oh how the mighty have fallen. Musashi at level 50 has 67,000 health and damage, which is not too bad, but the issue with Musashi is that because Talented Dancer is straight up better thanks to costing less than half the price of Musashi, as well as being able to deploy a lot more of them, Musashi's wave immune niche has fallen to the wayside. Musashi does still have a valuable niche however, this being the fact that he outranges Cadaver Bear, which is very hard for a non uber rare Z killer to do, making this niche use extremely useful, especially in 4 star stages. They also have a 30% chance to freeze relic enemies for 3 seconds, however, like with Mecha Bun, there's a unit further down his list who does a better job at freezing relics. Musashi is also somewhat sluggish, meaning that if you're away from the base, he will take a while to reach the front lines. All in all, what was once a great unit has tumbled down because of other units doing his job better, but still has a valuable niche as one of the best counters for Cadaver Bear in 4 star stages, who is especially hard to fight. Yulala before their true form was considered one of the worst legend units in the game because of their poor DPH and rushing nature, leading them to die very easily. However, their true form has actually redeemed them somewhat. At level 50, Yulala has 81,000 health and deals 13.5k damage with 6.6k DPS. While these stats are still pretty unimpressive, they do get one thing that allows them to have a valuable niche. This is the fact that they have massive damage against relic enemies. Now dealing 40,500 damage against relics isn't that big, he does have about 20,000 DPS. He isn't taking out relics on his own, but if you pair him with other relic attackers, his constant chipping will be of great use to you. They pair especially well with slapsticks, as they are a lot more spammable but can take a little bit to take out their targets. Yulala excels in speeding up the process of taking out major threats thanks to their high attack rate. However, outside of their anti-relic niche, you're better off using other LD units as his actual stats aren't enough to keep up with the other offensive units in the late game. Also, Yulala's recharge goes from 92.8 seconds to 69 seconds, allowing them to be sent in more easily and isn't as big of a risk if Yulala dies. They also have a standing range of 350 and an LD of 200 to 500, allowing them to snipe some enemies that might be standing behind a peon enemy like a lot of relic bosses tend to do, especially an enemy like Autumn. If you remembered what I mentioned at the start of the video, how I'll be ranking one unit in two different spots because of the fact that the two forms are inherently different from one another, well this is what I meant. When talking about Bahamut here, remember I'm only discussing his nuker form and Awakened Bahamut is not relevant for this specific ranking. Anyways, Bahamut is a nuker who can deal some serious damage, however, by the end game standards, 110,000 damage is okay for this point of the game, but the fact that he only attacks every 20 seconds means he's heavily reliant on a good defense. He also has a rather long force swing of 4 seconds, causing him to miss his attack sometimes. 
Also, his survivability is also extremely poor for this point of the game, being shut down by any push that happens thanks to him only having 33,000 health, which is actually lower than Holy Valkyrie's health. Generally, most other units can do his job better as a nuker, either due to being specialized or being easier to get onto the field. Bahamut's base form has definitely fallen off, but is still this high up because of his nuking abilities can still be pretty devastating if he can keep him guarded. He even gets the one shot, the infamous 200% Wild Doge. Awaken Mina is a unit whose main role is to be an LD attacker. Before her true form, she was pretty bad at this job, but her true form gave her the stats to be useful as an LD attacker. She can also work as a good anti-relic crowd controller thanks to her ability to weaken relic enemies for 3.3 seconds. Mina dealing 32,400 damage is okay, but nothing mind-boggling. She also has 48,600 health, which is fine. However, these stats in the endgame are rather mediocre compared to the other options that are available. This is somewhat mediated due to her fast recharge of only 96 seconds. Mina does have some really good LD that is from 300 to 700 range, allowing her to snipe really far away enemies such as Kamal variants, Professor A, and Calamari, provided she is given a stepping stone. Her standing range of 435 also helps keep her safe from most threats. If you have slapsticks weakened talents, then they can pair extremely well with Mina thanks to the fact that Mina can hit further away than slapsticks and has a higher weakened chance, allowing enemies like M. Most and Relic Bun Bun to be weakened more easily. However, she does fall off somewhat in the endgame thanks to an overall shift of what is relevant in the endgame. This by no means makes her a bad unit, but rather the current meta is pretty unsuitable for her skill set at the moment. This was a hard choice on where to put between the 12th and 11th spot, but I think Mask Grandmaster has slightly more to offer at the table. Before receiving their true form, they were mainly used as a peon cleaner thanks to their constant barrage of waves, but in their true form, they gained several buffs that actually make them pretty good. The biggest change is the fact that they are now strong versus relic enemies, doubling their effective health to a mass of 145,800 HP against relics. They also have a recharge of only 36 seconds, making them have a faster recharge and even some super rare gacha units. They also have a level 5 wave, allowing them to have a massive piercing range since these are guaranteed waves. Their rather cheap price also means that they can be sent in rather easily. The main use for Mass Grandmaster is to snipe long range relic enemies such as Loris and Loki. They also have a 30% chance to curse, making these enemies less annoying to fight if they get cursed. If they land a direct hit on a relic enemy and they take all of the hits plus the waves, Mass Grandmaster can deal nearly 60,000 damage with 41,000 DPS. However, you'll usually get half of this number, especially since you want to keep him safe as he has a rather small standing range of 255, making a lot of relic enemies outrange him. Also, outside of relics, their damage output isn't the best thing in the world, only having a max output of 38,800 damage with 6 hits, but since he is best used as a wave piercer, this number goes down to only 19,400 damage, which is a very small amount of damage. However, he is saved by his high attack rate. A unit like Mass Grandmaster is best used on levels where you can set up opportunities for him to fire a ton of waves to chip down the backline and is super useful against relics who stand way behind the front line, like Loris or other stages that use a ton of peon enemies. Gigando Jr. is unlocked from the Aku Realms and is a pretty good unit, as they have a rather hard to come by trait of being specialized against trailers enemies. The way Gigando works is that they deal 2 weak attacks and a larger attack with surge and knockback ability against traitless enemies. In total, Gigando can deal around 100,000 damage against traitless enemies thanks to the surge. Gigando also has an effective 23,000 DPS against traitless enemies thanks to said surge. Gigando also has an effective 167,400 HP against traitless enemies. They also have curse immunity. This allows them to be useful on stages in UL, since curse is a very common effect here. They also have surge immunity, and with their decent standing range of 360, they outrange most surge enemies. However, Gigando has these abilities thanks to Water Conservancy, a stage that features the traitless Cappy Jr. who blasts powerful surges and is an aggressive pusher, along with the backliner cursor Loris. However, outside of fighting traitless enemies, the other stats are somewhat lacking. They aren't at the point where they can only work against traitless enemies, but his damage output against other traits is somewhat lackluster, only being able to deal a maximum of 64,800 damage, and that is if they land the Surge. They also have 83,700 health, which is fine enough as well. His two knockbacks don't give him many chances to reposition, so preventing pushes is key to keeping him alive. 
Jigano as a unit is good against traitless enemies and has good enough stats to work in mixed stages, but is not really meant to be used as a generalist, but his niche as being an anti-traitless unit is something that should not be ignored. Master Earl is a unit unlocked from floor 50. Master Earl's main role is to be an anti-relic crowd controller. Now when you look at the stats, it may say that Earl has 2 seconds of slow, but because of his surge attack, Earl effectively has 3.8 seconds of slow against relic enemies since his level 3 surge, and it has a rather consistent spawn area, spawning between 400 to 600 range. This gives him an uptime of 90%, meaning if you pair him with a unit like Cyberpunk, you can easily achieve perma slow. This can make serious pushers like Relic Bonbon and M Oz grind to a halt, as he outranges most Relic enemies with a 375 standing range. However, if you're expecting this guy to hit hard, then I'm sorry to say that his damage output is rather low. He only has a base damage of 5400, meaning he will only deal 21600 damage thanks to the surge. What is surprising is that his survivability is actually pretty impressive. He has a pretty large 108,000 health and with 3 knockbacks, he'll usually be able to get a slow, then get knocked back to put him into a safer spot and start grinding enemies to a halt once more if needed. His kit means that he can only be used on stages with powerful relic enemies, but when brought to these stages, he can really help support your units. The first of the uncanny legend units is on this list and also ends up being the first one unlocked. Doguemon, or Dogumaru as people call him, is by design meant to be a tank. They are resistant against traitless and relic enemies, having an effective 626,400 health against them. They also have the Colossus Slayer and the Behemoth Slayer abilities. They're also immune to Warp and Curse. Before their true form, they were somewhat clunky to use thanks to them not having enough health to really be used in most places. Plus their somewhat long recharge made it risky to send in, but their recharge was fixed, going from 102.8 seconds to 69 seconds, making them rather spammable. Their damage isn't too bad either, being able to deal 64,800 damage with 8.5k DPS. Their stats make them a reliable tanker to bring against stages with traitless and relic enemies, but since they have the Colossus Slayer and Behemoth Slayer abilities, I will cover how well he performs against these groups of enemies real quick as well. For Colossus Slayer, Dogumaru only really works against Zero Luza, not because his stats are bad against Colossus enemies, but rather the stage design of the Gauntlets makes it somewhat hard to bring Dogumaru to them. Against Colossus Traitless or Colossus Relic enemies, however, they have a massive 894,000 health, allowing them to take a massive beating for a long while. Against other Colossus enemies, the health is at around 223,000 HP. As for the damage output, dealing 103,000 damage is pretty good chipping damage. As I said though, Dogumaru is somewhat tricky to bring to other Colossus Gauntlets because they are usually bullied Dogumaru thanks to their somewhat low standing range of 350. Against Behemoths though is where they truly shine. Against regular Behemoths, they have 261,000 health and deal 162,000 damage. This makes them an excellent choice for most stages where you need a wall for a bit, but against Traitless and Relic Behemoths, their taking stats are even better. Against Relic or Traitless Behemoths, they have an effect of 1.04 million health. This makes them an amazing option against enemies like Cumulus Gallus and Mega Majo. However, since this unit is somewhat specialized, when not fighting their targets, they suffer due to their relative lack of health for a tanker and also somewhat short range of 350 makes them vulnerable to constant onslaughts of enemy attacks. Also, if you're wondering why they have warp immunity, this has allowed them to be a good option against Mass Yulala and in their true form, Spiritual Yulala as well. All in all, this unit's tanking abilities against their traits are what allow them to just sit there and eat hits and this is how Dogumaru claims the 8th spot on this list. Uranwolf, that unit you unlocked all the way back in Stories of Legend still holds up as a good ranged attacker. Her damage output is still great, dealing 36,400 damage with a DPS of 10,219. Keeping her well guarded means that she'll be able to quickly fizzle out the HP of enemies, and since this list is focused on endgame, she also pairs well with another unit that's also on this list, but she's still solid on her own. She has a standing range of 450, allowing her to outrange plenty of enemies. Her health is a little low, having 56,700 HP. Her knockback ability can be pretty useful if you get lucky, as she can reposition enemies back, keeping not only her safe, but your other midrangers safe as well. However, her main flaw is her somewhat long recharge of 159 seconds, as if she dies, you might not be able to have enough time to get another one out. There isn't much else to say about Ururun. She's a good generalist ranger unit who has the ability to knock back, allowing some ground to be recovered if you get lucky.
Okay, so what if you took Urarun and made a straight up better version of her? Well, the result would be Awaken Earth, as she has the exact same amount of damage, health, and DPS. However, she has a few differences that make her a straight up better version than Urarun. The most minor is her having a range of 460. While this difference is small, it can be very big on stages featuring Master A and Project A, as well as the Sloth, as she outranges these enemies. In 4 star, these enemies can be a massive pain due to the lack of range options for these three. However, her main advantage over Urarun is her flexibility when it comes to Behemoth and Colossus enemies. Against Colossus enemies, she has 81,000 health and deals nearly 60,000 damage with 16.3k DPS. Due to her high range, she can work on multiple Colossus gauntlets, especially Baron Seal. However, ironically enough, she is the only Colossus Slayer UL unit who isn't good for Luza due to the fact that she isn't really specialized for this one encounter, so it's best that when you get the chance, save her true form for a bit later. Against Behemoth, she has an impressive 94,500 health and deals a massive 91,000 damage, giving her 25,000 DPS against Behemoth enemies. She also has a rather high Behemoth dodge chance of 30%, making her one of the three units with Behemoth Slayer to not have the usual 5% dodge chance, boosting her survivability by a little bit. One interesting thing is that Earth has a longer recharge than Uran, but this is only by 3 seconds, as her recharge is 162.8 seconds. This is negligible though, because you're using her as a ranger, not a meat shield. She's also 75 cents cheaper, which is also negligible for the same reason. While Earth may be individually better than Uran, when combined with Uran, you'll get the closest thing to a unit duplication glitch to the fact that these units have some of the smallest differences ever. Earth also has a chance to weaken, but this, like Uran's knockback, is more of a bonus than anything. Ape Lord Luza is perhaps one of the best non-Uber units ever made to counter a specific trait. Luza has been described as the definitive relic buster thanks to a combination of their good generalist stats with a mix of both massive damage and resistibilities against relics. Luza also has Behemoth Slayer, Surge Immunity, Weaken Immunity, and Warp Immunity. Somewhat unrelated, but Luza is the only UL true form without Colossus Slayer and this has confused me ever since the release of 12.0. Anyways, Luza's Surge Immunity is a great tool when fighting many stages in UL thanks to Surge enemies like Saint Dober as well as the Surge base. Their weak immunity means they can't be shut down by some enemies, most notably Urs and Fenrir as well as Elder Flame Doron. Luza is also one of the two units on this list with multiple hit zones, so instead of saying a bunch of numbers, here's a nice looking table on how much damage Luza does against each target in each of the hit zones, and I will break down each one by one. Luza has two hit zones one that lands between 1 to 401 range, and another that's between 250 to 550 range. This means that enemies that stand between 250 to 401 range get the full swing of Luza's attack. Most relic enemies will usually stand within this 250 to 401 range, meaning they'll take a ton of damage in rapid succession, as the second hit happens almost immediately after the first one. However, the second hit can miss if the first hit gets the knockback. Since they also have the resist ability, I'll also put up a chart comparing their base health with their health against relics, behemoths, and relic behemoths. Their health allows them to tank hits if needed against their targets, and since they have 3 knockbacks, they have pretty good survivability. Their usage against behemoths is okay, since while they definitely pack a punch, their health isn't anything too impressive against behemoths. When looking at the damage chart again, we can see that Luza could deal a mind-boggling 648,000 damage against relic behemoths. While there are currently only 3 as of this video's release, they all don't want to eat a Luza hit at all. Mega Majo will usually die in 4 hits and same goes with Great Ape Luza. Nala may take a little longer to kill, especially with the freeze, but even then Nala isn't safe from the Banana Slamma. For his generalist use, you wouldn't want to use them as your main attacker, but in mixed stages, they can hold on their own. Their standing range of 400 isn't too bad either. Just like Dogomaru, Warp Immunity is literally just for spiritual Yulala. Luza does suffer from a lack of speed, meaning that this lumbering beast will take a long while to reach the front lines. However, the biggest flaw with Luza is just what it takes to get the big guy in the first place. 100 stones, 20 of each color. While this stone cost sounds ridiculous, the cost is really worth the effort because this guy just mollywops almost any relic enemy they come across. Also, fun fact, Luza's evolution cost is only twice of Cactus Cat. The more you know. Awakened Doron is the third legend unit unlocked from the Uncanny Legends. Doron is a relic crowd controller as they have a level 3 surge that freezes relics for 6.67 seconds. 
In their true form, they gain extra speed as well as the Colossus and Behemoth Slayer abilities as well as the knockback ability. It is generally preferred to use Doron's true form, but there are some situations where you don't want to knock back the relic targets, like the M. Austin Infernal Tyrant Neandum's Force stage. If all three surges connect, the effective freeze time is 8.5 seconds. Doron's damage output isn't bad at all, as being the cheapest legend unit in the game, you can usually send in this 120,000 damage bomb for only 1800 cost, making a pretty good filler unit. Doron also has a shit ton of immunities, but surprisingly, no toxic immunity, making him somewhat hard to bring on stages with toxic enemies, especially on Zalo spam stages. Doron's damage against Colossus and Behemoth enemies is also nothing to scoff at when the Surge connects against them, being able to deal 191,000 damage against Colossus enemies, and being able to deal a massive 300,000 damage against Behemoths. This makes Doron a great filler unit in Behemoth stages, where the boss isn't Surge immune, such as Cumulus Gallus, Rangmaster, and Scizorex. Doron also has a major use against Zero Luza, as his knockback is vital in keeping Luza back, as the next best option is Supercar, and outside of that, you're really squeezed out of units who can knock back Luza. Though it should be noted that Doron is a self-destruct unit, meaning they attack once and then disappear, meaning if he misses his attack, then say goodbye to those 1800 cents. If you use Glass and Stone Cat, then you'll know what I mean. This means you could really only use Doron every 53 seconds, so it's very important to know when to send in Doron, but if you time him right, he could really be a game changer on the field. ED is the ultimate reward for beating Stories of Legend, and she is a unit who's extremely good at her job. ED's main role is to be an anti-relic awakened Bahamut, trading base damage for being able to nuke relic enemies, along with a higher base health. At level 50, Iddy's damage is the equivalent to a level 30 Awakened Bahamut, being able to deal 94,500 damage per hit with 20,000 DPS. Against Relic enemies, however, this damage goes to a massive 283,000 damage per hit. Iddy also has 40,000 HP, allowing her to usually score multiple hits against her opponents. Even though she has a lower standing range than Awakened Bahamut of 175, she's still fast enough to land her massive hits against her foes. The only relic enemies who she may struggle to land multiple hits against are against fast attack rate enemies like Loki, Relic Bun Bun, and Emost, the latter having a 5 second slow with knockback. Ed is also surge immune, allowing her to have a favorable matchup against Ancient Mega Majo and Evil Emperor Cat. She is also useful on stages with the Death Surge and the Surge Base. Ed, if supported by anti-relic crowd controllers, can be a devastating unit against relic enemies, especially with the likes of Oldhorn and Puffington. If you have a slowed Puffington, Iddy is usually safe to land a hit against him and take almost 75% of Puffington's health in one hit. In short, Iddy has a lower base damage than Bahamut, but in exchange can be a devastating unit against relic enemies, along with being a somewhat tankier version of Bahamut with Surge Immunity, allowing her to be used in some situations where Bahamut would be useful. Awaken Nala takes the second spot on this list. Awakened Nala is the 4th legend unit unlocked from Uncanny Legends and before her true form, it was an alright unit but the true form really made her shine. Nala gaining a boost to her health helped her survivability as well as a consistent 100% weaken which was much better than the 40% chance of her other two forms. The biggest change to her was getting Colossus Slayer as well as Behemoth Slayer. Nala is strong versus relic enemies, meaning she can be surprisingly tanky against her relic foes, especially with a 4 second weaken. Nala, like Luza, has multiple hit zones, however, these hit zones are rather disconnected with each other, as the first hit zone is from 1 to 301, the second being from 300 to 500, and the third one being from 500 to 700. This means Nala only lands 2 hits at exactly 300 and 500 range. However, since Nala's piercing goes up to 700 range, this means she could be an excellent counter to Loris. Now to cover her damage potential, here's a table showcasing her base damage, damage against relics, behemoths, colossus, relic behemoths, and relic colossus enemies. Nala is able to deal some serious damage against her foes. While Nala's base damage isn't too high, this damage will add up quickly, especially thanks to her fast attack rate. Nala works especially well against enemies like Ape Lord Luza, Zero Luza, and Mega Bajo. Also, because of her weaken, Nala can stay safe from these threats for a long time. To look at Nala's health, I will bring up another table to showcase it, with weakened relics in mind. Something else that Nala could do is land all three hits against the enemy base, allowing her to deal 136,000 damage to the base, but this is only because of how the hitbox of the base works. Nala is already somewhat of a beefy unit, having a base 135,000 health, but with her having many targets, along with the fact that she can weaken relic enemies means her effective health goes up dramatically. 
This makes them a prime unit to bring on most behemoth-based stages. However, she isn't too useful in most Colossus Gauntlet stages because of her rather low range of only 300, unless it has plenty of stepping stones. She also only has two knockbacks, giving her only one chance to reposition. Nala also has 16 speed, meaning without setting in meat shields ahead of time, she's at risk of being slaughtered by the enemies. However, while these may hinder her survivability a bit, she can still do amazingly as a pierce attacker. She also has wave and surge immunity, giving her even more usage against enemies like Rajakon, Hazuku, Masked Grandmaster, and Megumajo. She is even viable for some wave and surge base stages which don't have her main targets thanks to her pierce, being able to hit any backliner enemies that are sometimes present and slowly chip them down. Most wave enemies also tend to have rather low ranges, meaning if you send in shield units like Loa Mohawk and the like, she can constantly fire off some decent damage. Though do try keeping her away from the base unless the level is over, as she effectively has the smallest range in the game when facing the base, as she stands at one singular range, making her stand in front of your meat shields. All in all, Nala's amazing stats make her an excellent unit that is super good in many situations, especially for 4 star UL, where your options for units are rather limited. Plus, since you gather so late into UL, you can see just how much of a terror she is in 4 star thanks to the fact that 4 star still has the base magnifications. What is there to be said about Awakened Bahamut that hasn't been said already? High damage, extremely high DPS, extremely fast, and all the other goodies that come with Awakened Bahamut, but I guess I'll break down on why I think Awakened Bahamut is the best legend unit. Remember that I'm only talking about the third form here, as Base Bahamut is a fundamentally different unit in almost every way, and I already talked about them earlier. Awakened Bahamut is what happens when you take a nuker and make them a rusher. In exchange for only having 200 standing range, Awake of Bahamut now has 60 speed instead of 6, making him one of the fastest units in the game, along with an astounding 39,000 DPS, making it the second highest raw DPS in the game, just behind Greater Balrog Cat at level 50. Bahamut's 121,000 damage for a nuker is fine, but as a rusher, good lord he can cripple so many enemies. This damage can make your other units do a lot less work in taking down any enemy you may come across. Bahamut's recharge is also a lot shorter, going from 2.5 minutes to a minute and 40 seconds. Bahamut's sheer speed allows him to easily get hits on many enemies, especially LD enemies, where unless you really suck at timing, can easily get past their blind spot. Bahamut is also more flexible than Itty thanks to his higher damage output. However, Bahamut does have a rather low 33,000 health, making Bahamut not able to really utilize all 6 of their knockbacks. Bahamut can also struggle against high attack rate enemies if you aren't able to time the send in, as he will constantly be juggled. In the end, Bahamut's sheer potential damage he can dish out is really absurd if you use him right. Sometimes, brute force is all you need instead of having a bunch of abilities because while some units can slow, freeze, be immune to waves or surge, and that's cool and all, is there all really a point when you can just kill the enemy in a few hits? So, that was my ranking for every single legend unit to exist in the game as of version 12.3. If you enjoyed this video, then why not give it a like, and if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel as it helps me out in the long run. If you agree or disagree with this list, let me know in the comments down below as I'm interested to know what your thoughts are, as I am only one person and seeing what others think is very interesting and useful to help open discussions about some of these units. Also, shout out to the Prodigy Rect and Carlos Solitaros for being channel members. If you want to receive a shout out at the end of these videos, then consider becoming a channel member as you'll also receive a special role in my Discord server which you can find a link to down below. Anyways, I hope you have a wonderful day.